Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Becoming a Bible Nerd. We are on Acts chapter 21. So we do not have much left in this chapter. We've uh, we've made it pretty far. Um, it's not going to be much longer. This will wrap up at the end of May. Um, this morning I have a little fur baby with me, so we're going to see how this goes. She's probably going to whine a lot. Um, I um, see while y'all are getting on, good morning, that uh, a lot of y'all liked chapter 19, the one that I was nervous about, um, but I got a lot of good feedback and people really sent me um, some encouraging, exciting messages about it. And so what that kind of told me is that people out there are hungry for theology and teaching on how to live righteously, and that is going to um, be taught a lot more in Paul's letters. So all the letters that he's writing to like Corinthians and Ephesians and Philippians, to all these places he's visited, those will be instructions on how to live and we will hit those at future dates. So that's exciting. Um, this Bible helped me so much. Um, it's the NLT Illustrated Study Bible. It has a great map that takes two pages up and it gives all three or four of Paul's missionary journeys because this can be confusing. This chapter, I felt like it was confusing, um, tracking everywhere he went. But I'm gonna kinda just give you a summary. We're gonna talk this morning, go ahead and get started. So go ahead and open your Bibles to chapter 21. And um, we left with Paul giving, and we didn't cover chapter 20, but we left, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be so distracted this morning with this puppy. Um, we left in chapter 20 where um, Paul addressed the Ephesian elders and gave them some encouragement on um, how to run the church. Come here. <laughs> and so we pick up in 21 and Paul's on his way home to Jerusalem. Or I say home, he doesn't really have a home there anymore. But he wants to um, celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And he has done some fundraising along the way that um, we didn't talk about in the last chapter because we didn't go over it. But he's collected some money. He wants to bring that back to some um, the poor and some widows. And um, so he's traveling back home. So we're going to kind of go through shortly his journey to Jerusalem. So he um, told the elders in Ephesus goodbye. And then he goes, uh, well, he was in Maltus. And then he headed to Cos Rhodes, which was an island in Pantera. And then he sails to T um, Tyre. Tyre is in Phoenicia, which is on the mainland. It's north of Jerusalem. Um, it's a little bit north of Israel. Um, and so uh, Luke is with them. And when he gets to Tyre, he's going to stay there for seven days and talk to some disciples that were made. Now, I'm going to flip to Matthew 11:20, And um, some of you that studied Matthew, you'll remember this. But in Matthew 11:20, Jesus said, um, this is talking about Jesus. Then he proceeded to denounce the towns that, were, um, that saw most of his miracles because, but did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles that were done in you, had been, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes a long time ago. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable in Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And he cursed these towns in the triangle around the Sea of Galilee. And to this day, those towns are just ruins. They've never developed. It's in the most beautiful part of the land. But there was this curse on them. And still to this day, it's just ancient ruins to go visit. But we see Tyre flourishing. And um, there's some disciples there that were made after Stephen's... Um, Martyrdom, remember all the um, Greek-speaking Jews kind of fled for their lives. And so a lot of them found their way up in Tyre. And um, so there's a body of believers there. These men, through the Spirit, are going to warn Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And um, they pray for him. Now, Paul gets a lot of um, criticism from some critics that he was stubborn and headstrong. And though the Spirit had told him before, um, earlier that he knew that there's going to be suffering in Jerusalem and then here are these men through the spirit entire telling him and then we're about to see somebody else um, he gets a lot of criticism from some scholars that um, he was stubborn but um, I like how Dr. Constable um, states it. he says Paul looks at this as a warning to be spiritually prepared just like who who do we know went to Jerusalem regardless of the knowledge that he knew um, about his outcome and he spiritually prepared himself and I really want y'all to type that answer. Um, 
So from there, he sails to Ptolemus and stays one day. And then he goes to Caesarea Maritime. Yes, Jesus. Um, then he goes to Caesarea Maritime, and he stays there for days in the house of Philip. Now, remember Philip? It said that he was one of the seven. We met him, got to know him good in chapter 8. He went to Samaria. He was the one that encountered Simon the sorcerer. He preached there. Lots of people got saved. Well, evid saved. Evidently, he stayed there. Um, and this has been over 20 years. He's been there. He has four daughters now, and they are all prophetesses. prophetesses. Um, so in verse 10, Abigus came, and he prophesied um, over Paul about the dangers in Jerusalem. Now, Abigus is somebody we met in chapter 11. He prophesied about a great famine that did come to the land. And um, Paul's friends beg him not to go to Jerusalem. Let's look in verse 11. Um, and he said to uh, um and he came to us, talking about Abigus, took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands, and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to Gentile hands. And this is what Constable um, says about what is going on. Remember, we said that... Um, Earlier, Constable had said that Paul viewed this as a warning to be spiritually prepared just like Jesus had done. Um, this is what Constable says. We, uh, the third we section in Acts, meaning Luke is with them right now, is of theological importance because it focuses on Paul's similarities of Jesus' passion. Note the similarities between Luke's account of Jesus' trip to Jerusalem and Paul's. Both stories involve a plot by the Jews and handing over to Gentiles. There were triple predictions along the way of suffering for both cases. Both Jesus and Paul steadfastly resolved to go there despite opposition, and both resigned themselves to God's will. That's huge, and we're going to get back to that later. So Paul, being as strong-willed as he is, he believes this is God's will, so he wants to be spiritually prepared, and he has his friends pray for him. So he ends up arriving in Jerusalem, and this is 20 years after that Jerusalem council where they decided that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised, but there were four rules that they encouraged Gentiles to begin the Christian walk with. This is 20 years later. So he enters the city, and he's welcomed gladly by James. That's Jesus' half-brother that is overseeing. He's the head of the church in Jerusalem. He's welcomed by James and the elders, and they discuss that there's this nasty rumor about Paul um, that, um, that Paul has been telling diaspora Jews to abandon the law of Moses. And this has gotten out of control, and I'm sure that it just grows daily, this... Um, this rumor. Um, he, it's believed that he's telling the Jews in the diaspora not to um, hold fast to their uh, customs and traditions and to flee circumcision. Now, that is not true at all. He's telling Gentiles that they don't have to become Jews to be saved. That's what he's saying, that the act of circumcision would have made a Gentile become a Jew, and that was not necessary to become a Christian and to be saved by Jesus. Um, so the elders and James tell Paul to do this in verse 23, if y'all take a look. And I need to get there. In verse 23, we have four men who have obligated themselves with a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. That was typical. At the end of the vow, you went into the temple, and you paid a temple fee, and the priest shaved your head. Now, usually during this vow, you didn't go to work, and so somebody that was older and more wealthy than you would pay this fee. That was common. Then everyone will know um, that what was told about you, um, the account, blah, then everyone will know what that what they were told about you amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are careful about observing the law. With regards to the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter um, containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and um, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. So, we are going to take a minute and talk about this whole law thing. Um... The Hebrews missed it. These Jews 
um, in this day, they missed it, and I think we miss it too. Um, God's design from the very beginning was for his people to be holy. And to um, the word holy means to be set apart. And I wrote down in my notes, to be recognizably different. He wanted his people to be a light to the world. And in order to be a light, they had to be recognizably different. And they did this through holiness, to be set apart. Um, God did not want the outside world to influence his people because then they would look like the outside world and their light would grow dim. He gave them the law, which is boundaries, to protect this outside influence from coming in. So the Jews, like some of us, taught their people that this was easier to do by completely separating themselves, that the outside world is dirty, they will contaminate us, we cannot touch them, we cannot dine with them, we cannot do anything, so we will separate ourselves completely. On the other hand, today, many of us think that um, we are free from the law, which Paul's gonna teach that, um, and so they can encourage to completely abandon it. Oh, you don't have to go. You don't have to obey the law. I don't believe that either one of these was God's intent. I believe his intent was for the law, which is directions on how we can live holy. So let me back up. His intent was for our holiness to be a light to the world, like a lighthouse. Think of this. Um, there are People lost at sea and there's a storm. And that's really what it is for lost people. They are lost and they might not know they're in a storm, but there is a storm. There is, um, and, and they are lost. And God wants us to be a lighthouse with this huge flame to ignite, to be waving them to safety. And holiness is what ignites this fire. Um, I was on the plane, um, you know, y'all know I went to Atlanta, that's why I wasn't here to teach on Thursday, um, and I was on the plane next to a gentleman, and um, we were just talking about um, our personal lives, but it ended up talking about um, the Lord, and he said, I'm a, a believer in Jesus, and I attend church, he said, but I'm really struggling with something, I just can't wrap my mind around Jesus being the only way. There are good people in this world and they are worshiping God in their way or their own gods. And I can't imagine them going to hell and, um, and Jesus being the only way. And he was just questioning these things. And, um, you know, I just started thinking about that when I got home. It's like, truth be told, we've all had those questions. We've all thought about those things. And if we haven't thought about them ourselves, we've had people question us about it. So this morning, I want you to just clear all your thoughts and I want you to really ask yourself one question. Do you really believe God's word is true? It's a yes or a no question. Do you believe God's word is true? If, the, if you answer no, then that I believe that's an easy way out. We can reason a way that surely God has a plan B. That what he says, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father, surely that's a fib and he's just tricking all of us and surely there's another way for these people who don't accept for him to have eternity with him. That would be so easy because if we believe that, if Jesus has a plan B, then guess what? All of our time, all of our desires belong to us. We don't have to share that with anyone. But if we believe God's word is true, our answer is yes. Then we're held responsible to tell the entire world about Jesus. We can't just believe that people are going to die and go to hell if they don't know Jesus personally as their Savior and sit back and do nothing. That is why it's so hard, I think, for people to actually really accept it because then it puts the responsibility on us. And there is no noise out there. I mean, there needs to be some cheering. This is our responsibility. Um, so this is why I want us to go to verse 13. This is how Paul can say this in verse 13. I skipped it on purpose. It's, um, this is when his friends are saying, don't go to Jerusalem. Things are going to end badly for you. And Paul's response is, 
what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart for I am ready not only to be bound but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus this is exactly why he says this that he believes Jesus is the way the truth and the life and the only way to the Father and so there is nothing that is gonna stop him not death nor life and he's gonna go through so many things and nothing is gonna stop him because he believes that there is a lost and dying world out there and he has to bring the good news of salvation to him um, I was thinking about this I was studying this on Saturday and I was thinking about it on Sunday when I was in church and we started singing this song and it's one of the most passionate songs that I think that you can sing right now it's called great are you Lord and I'm gonna just read some of the lyrics it says you give life you you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness and I mean whenever you sing this you just want to throw your arms up and you just want to take a big gulp of air in and just praise God with everything that you have but if we really and truly believe this that you are a life and love and hope and restore broken hearts we have a responsibility and a duty to go tell everyone if we really believe that then we should be shouting from the rooftops to everyone we know that Jesus is Lord and he's the only hope so what does this look like what does making our life a lighthouse look like and I think that there's three steps um, Step one is we have to cleanse our temple. Back in the day, we see all these rules and regulations about how to enter the temple and where to stand and who's allowed and who's not allowed. And you have to um, sacrifice a lamb and you have to do all these things. When Jesus died and sent the Holy Spirit to us, our bodies became a temple. And we need to revere that just as much as the Jewish people revered their temple in the day. So we have to clean out our temple. The more junk that we get out, and the more we strive for holiness, the bigger our light comes, the more recognizable we are as Christians and light to the world. Now, um, and Jesus said, they will, you will know them by their fruit. I'm just going to go through a couple of examples. The list is extensive, and I'm not picking on any one person. But for me, when I started cleaning out my temple, to me, the easiest, most obvious thing was to clean up my language. Um, the Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue. And then when we become followers of Christ, we have a spirit of self-control. And for us to spew out profanities quickly diminish, diminishes our light. We are called to be set apart and different and when we talk like the world, we're gonna to begin to look like the world and our light is gonna grow dim. So that's a easy, quick start. Gossiping, when everybody's in the office talking about somebody, we've got to tame our tongue. The music that you listen to, things that make you lust, what does your eyes see, what do your ears hear? Are you in bed with someone who is not your spouse? Um, where do you go for fun? Do you look like the world? Are the practices in your life the same as the world or do you look different? But the strive for holiness is the ingredient that ignites the flame and makes it bigger. Now I have to say two things. Things. Paul is going to go through and this is what he's doing whenever the Jews are saying hey you're diminishing the law that is not what he was doing at all but what he was telling the world was that there's not salvation in the law that that would be works and there's nothing that we could possibly do that would be good enough to get to heaven so this do it obeying the law and doing these things do not get us saved only the grace of God through his son Jesus and his shed blood leads us to a life of eternity with him but these are two things we live holy lives we obey the law for two things one Jesus says if you love me you obey me so that is our way to love him back we can go to church every Sunday and we can raise our hands and be the loudest person singing those songs but that is not it doesn't say that it doesn't say go to church and sit on the front row and throw your hands up and sing loud to me and that's how you love me he says if you love me then you will obey me so our obedience is love back to our Holy Father and then we obey God and we strive for holiness because we love others we believe that they're lost at sea in a storm and that we need to provide a lighthouse that's how we love others is to live holy and to live righteously 
So that is step one, to clean out our temple. And I pray today that we can all go and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the things in us that look like the world and that are dimming our light. The step two is to get out and get messy. We can live holy, righteous lives in the safety of our home, but who would ever see our light? We need to get out into the world and we need to touch Gentiles, get messy. What are their needs? Do you have a neighbor that their yard is just a hot mess? Go and mow it. Maybe their mower is broken or maybe they're a single mom or maybe they're depressed or you have no idea. So we can just go and dig in and get... Um, do yard work. We can let people take the parking place that's trying to beat us to it. You know what? Who cares? Let them have the parking place. Um, we can smile, notice hurting people, ask the Lord to give us eyes for people out there that are lost, that are hurting, that are suffering. And so we need to touch Gentiles, get messy, and step three, we're going to talk about on Thursday because it ties into the message so beautifully. We're going to stop here this morning, but I just encourage you to, to seek for these lighthouse moments we have to fuel that fire. We do that through holiness to strive to live differently. And we love others by being this light. So I encourage you to read chapter 22. I'll meet you on Thursday. We'll talk about what step three is to be a light to the world. Have a great day. Happy reading.